Welcome everyone to another episode of Paul on the Call. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Chris Rivers. And I'm Mandy Mack. Yes, and we are here with Jessica from Circus Mobility. So excited. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for, for meeting with us today and getting uh, us to know a little bit more about you and what you offer for pole dancers and aerialists. And maybe a little bit about yourself as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so would you like to start it off? Where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I want to say like I have been following you for, for quite a while on Instagram. And like I don't know if you like are into synchronicity, but I feel like always when you post like the little messages and everything, they're like right on point with what I'm feeling in my practice or like my training. So I appreciate all of like the little tidbits of knowledge and like all the exercises of course too that you give as well. But I wanted to mention that um, I thought it was really cool um, that you offered all of that advice as well as just the exercises. <laughs> yeah, people often ask me if I have, you know some sort of content plan and Absolutely no, no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> Basically, something occurs to me that's like resonating in my own practice. And then I share that with other people. So like, it makes sense that it resonates with other people because I'm going through the same things, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I love that that is, um, you make it an authentic experience. <laughs> so thank you for all that really great content. But um, I read a little bit about your bio and I guess yeah. before, before you came into Ariel's, do you want to talk about what, what you did before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I, uh, so I, I could go way back, um, <laughs> but I uh, basically stumbled into circus. Um, I was in my thirties and like, had a personal trainer and went to the gym and, but something felt missing. Like I was doing the things that I needed to do to stay physically active and healthy. Um, but I wasn't enjoying any aspect of it. And I grew up as an athlete. I was a competitive tennis player. I was a dancer. Um, and I kind of like lost that aspect of myself because I was so focused on my career, um, which was working as a leadership analyst at the CIA. So, um, and that I sort of stumbled into, I feel, I feel like my whole life has been that way. <laughs> Stumble into things and see how it works. Um, but I was a lawyer and after 9-11, um, the legal market sort of dried up and I went looking for something else, went back to grad school, got a master's in legislative affairs focused on in intelligence policy and ended up at the CIA. So that's where I found myself when I was like, oh, flying trapeze rig, that looks cool. <laughs> and realized I'm afraid of heights. Um, that I did not want to do that, but figured they probably had other things. And I liked to climb things as a kid. So I felt like there had to be something for me there um, and took an aerial silks class and immediately was like, this is it. Signed up the next day, kept signing up and then hired a trainer because I recognized I was not strong enough to do this thing. <laughs> and as someone who was used to being coached, I, I knew that the way for me to get better at this quickly was to have someone work with me one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's what I did. And um, eventually circus started to take over my life in a way it kind of has a tendency to do. <laughs> and I find my, found myself like in my day job, which is supposed to be a very important, you know, lifelong pursuit sort of thing, creating choreography and shows in the midst of working at the agency. And I was like, this is not sustainable. So I quit. 
<laughs> and now I, I do this full time. That's amazing. Is there like, were there any other people on the CIA that were like into pole dance too? Or were they like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, you know, I think at the time, no, like I knew one other person who um, took occasional silks classes. I think pole, they're probably, I mean, obviously there were, but it wasn't something that people talked about um very straight laced you know sort of job people very much trying to keep like professional private life very separate so even like the fact that i talked about doing aerial was weird now i can imagine it's very different um but 10 years ago 15 years ago whatever it was <laughs> people really didn't talk about it that much right yeah yeah that would be so funny because I always um, laugh like there's always subsets of like bunches of teachers that come into the studio or like doctors but that would be funny if there was like you know <laughs> a subset well, of people. <laughs> I, I lived in Washington DC right so you know when you go to the trapeze school or you go to you know the pole studios everyone is like that right everyone has some you know, some other life. And it's funny yeah. because that's their secret life, right? You know them as the pole artist or the circus artist or whatever, but like they're PhDs that are like doing all kinds of crazy shit <laughs> <laughs> and you know nothing about it. You just know this life that, you know, you're taking class with someone doing. It's so true. So incredible. You really have just kind of stumbled into it from a lawyer to CIA to now pole dancing to such a cool way. That's so inspiring. Right? Yeah. It's almost like you discovered that you were like more of an artist and you couldn't go on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, ex that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. Also, I, I couldn't I couldn't stand sitting at a desk all day anymore. That was yeah. just, it, it was like my body hurt and I knew it wasn't what I was doing training. It was that I was trying to sit for eight hours at a computer and then train at a high level. Yeah. And that combination was not working for my body. Mm. I believe it. I believe it. That's crazy. We're told like, go to school, do this, have your career. And you did all of that and then still said, I still want something else. Um, I think that speaks to a lot of people. Like um, we've been able to meet so many people who have these careers or muggle jobs. And the fact that you actually went and turned into, like made a new career, it's just, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I think that for me, I mean, part of what made that, like a normal thing to do is that um, growing up, my mom owned a health club and at a certain point decided, well, this is great, but I want to go back to school and I want to get my PhD and I want to go with this completely other route. Um, so to me, that just seems completely normal, right? You decide, no, this isn't it. And you can do a complete 180 shift and it'll be okay. <laughs> it'll work out. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And that's good that you had the role model to do that. Cause a lot of people are afraid to like, once they're like, I've put so much into this one thing, how could I ever be anything else? But you can be so many things during your life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you find that um, your old life um, helps you in this new life in any way? Or, or are they yes. just like so completely? Oh, yeah. Well, well, I would say, you know, you, you kind of are who you are, you're drawn to certain things. And so things that I was drawn to about that life, I'm still drawn to now, right? I'm, I am very analytical. So I was drawn to being a lawyer. I was drawn to being a CIA analyst and I'm drawn to analyzing movement and, and helping other people like achieve their goals based upon kind of dissecting 
what it is they're going after, what their body's doing, all of this stuff. Um, so it's, it's the same, like kind of way my brain works. Um, and definitely like working at the agency honed my, my ability to just pull out relevant information and like come to conclusions quickly and to evaluate the quality of information <laughs> because we live in a world where there's lots of information coming at you and not all of it is something that you should be paying attention to. Um, so same is true in the fitness space, right? There's lots of people saying a lot of things on Instagram and, you know, how do you choose what it is that you're going to rely on to inform your training? Um, so yeah, definitely those past things have informed the way that I look at what I do now. Wow. That's, that's awesome. And like you, um, you have so many different types of clients too, like in all different apparatus and like um, you, you are familiar with hypermobile bodies and everything. And I just think that's so amazing how you're able to like, you know, come up with all different programs for, for, to help everyone. <laughs> so that's probably yeah. because of your analytical back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, part of it's probably where that I don't know where to stop. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I, I see a thread and I just, I have a tendency to be curious and pull on it. Um, and so that takes me down paths where suddenly I've gained all this new knowledge just because I was curious about something that was happening in someone's body or something I read on the internet. Right. Um, so I, I go down rabbit holes and I learn lots of new things, um, based on that. And I think the, you know, working with lots of different apparatuses, with clients who have lots of different goals. Um, part of that is like, that's what keeps me going, right? If I worked with the exact same type of, that's not possible, but if I worked with the exact same type of person with the exact same goals over and over and over, um, it just wouldn't be as interesting to me. So when I, you know, this, this is what happened, you know, I had people come to me and say, I know you're an aerialist, but do you work with pole dancers? And I was like, well, I hadn't, but that sounds cool. <laughs> right. Um, and like it opened things up and like, you know, part of that for me was, well, if I'm going to work with these people, if someone wants to improve, right, their handspring, well, I should work on that. I should see what's going on in my body. I, sh you know, and suddenly I'm doing pole, <laughs> which, you know, was always something that was on the periphery of what I did. Um, I've always had tons of friends that were pole dancers, but just had never stepped into that space because quite physically, it was a different space. Right. Uh, I, I tended to work in circus schools and they didn't have pole in those schools. I did work in a pole studio um, for quite a long period of time, but it was very like things were very separated, like the aerial program and the pole program. There wasn't as much um, back and forth as there is now. Now it's just completely exploded. Um, but yeah, so I just, I didn't have the opportunity until people were interested in being coached on it. And I felt like I needed to do more due diligence on my end to understand um, the movements and things. Yes. Um, so you mentioned um, you started with other apparatuses and training those before um, coaching on pole. What other apparatuses do you work on if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, I, well, I started with silks and right after that started doing static trapeze um, and trained those in combination for probably the first three years um, and then really got into rope. Rope, rope is, is always going to be my, 
<laughs> my baby. <laughs> um, and from there, got more into dance trapeze than static trapeze um, and found I enjoyed spinning. Um, <laughs> and yeah, from there, like now I find myself doing a lot of Lyra, which I swear if you would have asked me when I first started Ariel, I would have laughed at you. I was like, oh, Lyra, that's not for me. That's for those really, really bendy people. And I'm not really bendy. Um, and yeah, and now, well, now I'm a lot more bendy than I was. <laughs> so that helps. <laughs> but also I think with how much, you know, all of this has grown. What we're finding is that there, there is a place for everyone within every apparatus. And now there are more people out there doing it. So you see different types of styles, different bodies, all of that doing all of the apparatuses. Whereas again, 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't true. If you looked at someone who was on, in Cirque and it was like, oh, that's that's how you do Lyra. Like that one person in that one show. <laughs> and now it can be anything. Oh my goodness. Oh, I just thought it the um you you trained on the rope and I I um took pole first and then I tried the rope, but I I liked the rope best um out of the aerial apparatus because it was like a wiggly pole. <laughs> I didn't even and, know you could do ropes, so I'm like fascinated by it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I liked it better than the silks because I, I felt like the silks kind of like pinched me more, much more, but the rope really translated to pull. But yeah. And then I was wondering, wow. um, have you done the Chinese pole at all? Because a lot of times they'll have those in the circus uh, training facilities. Yeah, I have. I um I haven't done it consistently because there hasn't been a single space that I've been in for a long period of time that has Chinese pull. Um, because the setup for it takes a lot of space. Um and like usually they are tensioned out, right? And you can actually like they're not attached at the top. <laughs> um so yeah, it takes a lot of square footage, which means they only have them really at really large circus schools. And I've had, you know, the occasion to train on Chinese pole in those schools, but I'm never there for any length of time. Um, but it it is like, um, I feel like it's it's again a lot of these things. It, they, it's like its own thing, right? Like skills translate, but if you think that you know, you're just going to hop on that apparatus and, <laughs> and look as good as you do on your apparatus on that one. No, no, no. <laughs> right. Like the, now there's the flying pole, like, like probably not going to be really good at that. <laughs> first <time> out. <laughs> what, what really amazes me. So flying pole can be like more like Chinese pole, or it can be yeah. more like dance pole, right? You can, yeah. it can be wrapped or not. I do not understand how people can use a chrome pole for flying pole. I I've seen people do it and I'm just like, that is not safe. <laughs> right. Like you must be using like all of the dry hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have like four skills that you feel confident on and that's it. Yeah. That's the only thing that's going yeah. into that act. <laughs> Holding on tight. <laughs> yeah. It's so cool though. Like I love how everyone's so creative with like, you know, the the variations of the theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is it is it easy to like construct different training programs for the, all of the different apparatus? Or are there like similarities between the two? Or or not two, there's like many, <laughs> but are there similarities at all? Yes. Yeah. I mean that that's the thing is that people are generally like there's maybe five to 10 skills that everyone is going after, or it can be break broken down in a way that is still like going back to that fundamental skill. So no matter what apparatus someone is training on, they're always looking to improve their inversions, whether they're bent arm or straight arm, right? 
And at the root of it, and you know, like a shoulder mount is an inversion, right? So the, you know, there's some differences in grip and strength and whatnot, but generally speaking, there are same muscle groups involved with all of these skills. Um, so yeah, it, that, that's the thing. That's what you start to notice, you know, even if like this happens all the time, someone comes in, fills out their onboarding form for the conclave, which is my three month program. And they say that their goal is something that I have never heard of before. (laughs) I'm like, what the hell is that? You made that up. (laughs) And so I mean, I'll search Instagram, no, hmm. <laughs> search YouTube, no idea. Um, and they'll send me a video and I'm like, oh, okay. That's just like, you know, this other thing on Lyra, right? That it always happens because the human body only moves in certain ways. So it doesn't matter which object you're trying to move around. It's, it's the same pathways, you know, whether you're moving in sagittal plane or frontal plane, or, you know, there's side bending or flexion, it, it's all the same. You're right though. That's true. I did find like um, the twisted grip um, makes its way in like the trapeze when you like wrap your arm around and then occasionally, Oh yeah. The flamenco. That's what it's called. <laughs> and then occasionally I'll have like a silks person come into my pole class and they won't be able to get the, uh, like a pole set. And I'll say, think of it as a hip key. And they're like, Oh, um, cause then they'll get like that, like sideways yeah. movement. So it is, there's a lot. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. The body only moves in so, so many <laughs> ways. <laughs> and you know, I, I have more information other than I just want to do this thing, which is, Like I have what the person's mobility is. I have videos of them doing other things. So even though their goal is this thing, which is a little different for me, I can still look at their body and go, okay, well, what's missing here are these fundamental things. How are these things applying to the skill that you want, right? Like how, how are they showing up in that skill? And then I can target those aspects of the skill to strengthen or mobilize or whatnot. That's awesome. I, think, I love that because that's like the missing link for, between like people who decide to like learn on their own or like, you know, get a trainer because everyone's body is different and having someone else look at you to see what is missing in your training is so helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And those fundamentals too, oftentimes we rush to the cool advanced stuff where we really need to like be working, like you said, on those fundamentals and those basic movements of our body. Yeah. I mean, the wonderful thing is that usually by the time people come to me to like sign up for one of my programs, they've reached the point that they understand that they're missing something fundamental, right? So they're completely open to doing this sort of, you know, repetitive drills that don't look anything, at least in their mind, like the skill that they're trying to attain. They, they were, they're walking into it with acceptance that they're missing something and someone else knows better than them. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> they're ready. <laughs> yeah, they're ready for it. Whereas, you know, people before that point are still in that place where it's, it's like going going after the next big thing. And if it doesn't work, well, uh, we'll just try something else instead. (laughs) (laughs) Well, do you want to talk about some of the different services that you offer and classes and online stuff? (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot. (laughs) I feel like it's just like ballooned in the past um, two years, which, you know, COVID has has a way of of doing that. Um, I, so I have a membership, which is called the parish, um, which is a monthly membership where people can sign up and cancel at any time, which includes tutorials from all of the apparatuses. Um, Not a lot of poll right now, but I will be expanding more into that in the future as I bring on a um, poll coach within the parish. 
but it also includes all of my mobility classes, which at this point is hundreds of recordings of mobility classes. Um, and then just a really amazing community. And that that's why I created the parish. I saw people um, doing their own little things all over the world on lots of different apparatuses and didn't see anything where there was really a place for people to come together to uh, like bounce ideas off of each other in lots of different domains, right? Everything feels a little siloed into, oh, I'm a Lyra person or I'm a pole person or, you know, whatever. Um, and this is a place for people to kind of all come together and share creativity and collaborate and learn cool shit. <laughs> Uh, so then there is uh, the Conclave, which I run two or three times per year, which is a three month program where I do completely custom programming for you based on your goals over that three month time frame. And they can be all different types of goals, flexibility, handstands, aerial pull. Um, and it's in like a great cohort. So you're getting that one-on-one -on -one custom thing, but you're also getting the support of, again, people from all over the world who are as committed as you are to achieving cool things. Um, and then I have Cardinal, which is my six-month mentorship for aerial and pole coaches. And what I saw there was a little bit of a gap in um, what was out there for coaches. So there's a lot of certifications, a lot of really, you know, weekend long certification on whatever, and people have a piece of paper, but they don't necessarily feel confident in what they're doing. And they haven't really thought beyond like classroom planning, right? Curriculum planning. They don't know, you know, if someone asks them, what should I be working on outside of class to get better at X, Y, and Z? They don't know how to answer those sorts of questions. They don't know how to build an inclusive um, consent-driven classroom. They, they don't know if they want to have their own studio. They don't know the type of practices they're going to help them, like, build their business in a way that's going to live up to their values, right? So there's, this is stuff outside of the actual coaching that comes into play um, that the card, that Cardinal addresses. And next year, I'm going to be adding a certification component to that. So people can be certified in my methodology um, and their studios or their businesses can be certified in my methodology as well. Um, and then I have classes that you can just drop in and take. <laughs> right now, I only have one per week, which is the Spinal Inquisition, which is a two-hour backbending class. And it's a really great group of people. So um, it's all levels, but for people who are working more contortion type skills, we go there. Um, I just am watching the screen and give people the modifications that they need if they're not at that level. Um, so if you notice something here, I'm really into all level um, classrooms because I think people really learn from seeing people at different stages of their journey. Um, and so even within the conclave, which is, you know, a three month program where people are really committed, we have people working on bent arm inversions and we have people working on like flare to flag advanced type strap skills. And the wonderful thing is that they're, they're going through the same journey together and they're learning, you know, from each other in that process. And so in my mobility classes, I like for it to be the same way. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate the community aspect of all of your, your classes too, because a lot of times, you know, we'll train on our own and, and we'll think that our training is by ourselves, but it's always better with a group. 
and that you do learn from others like way more than than you than we realize and then it, it advances all of our art especially yeah. like how you you um put all of the aerialists together because yeah. that is really inspiring because you can see things on another apparatus and be like oh actually I saw that recently there was like a, a move where I saw on the pole where I saw someone had put it on the lira and I was like wow I never would have thought of that um but yeah yeah and, <laughs> and so um I am hosting, so the parish is having its first like live in-person meeting in February um, in Hawaii on the Big Island. And the whole point of the get together, other than the social aspects, because people just, you know, want to see each other and hug each other in person, (laughs) um, is that cross collaboration on different apparatuses. It isn't going to be a series of workshops. It isn't a traditional retreat. It's a meeting, kind of like a meeting of the minds within the parish, which is here's what I'm working on. I wonder what this would look like on rope. I wonder, you know, how you could interpret it on the rope above the lira, like all of, all of that type of stuff that is hard to do, not in person. You can, you can try and definitely you can kind of see the threads of it on Instagram when people take inspiration <laughs> from other people. <laughs> the ins- it's actually inspiration when it's on a different apparatus. I, I will say that. It's not just copying. <laughs> um, but doing it on person in real time mm-hmm. allows you to kind of, you know, continue iterating in a way to tap into that creativity. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that a lot. It's so much fun. (laughs) And I like the name of the the Spinal Inquisition. That's pretty funny. (laughs) I noticed all of them have a theme, card and and whole Inquisition. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so I am from New Orleans originally, and um, which is a very Catholic city. (laughs) And I am not a religious person. (laughs) So I am definitely drawing from like my childhood and all of these kind of institution esteemed things that I'm just appropriating completely. I, I figure it. that's fair. I can appropriate religious iconography. Yeah. I yes. love it. They are just words in the end. <laughs> <laughs> that can be used in ways. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, um, let's see. And you said it, um, you, you had to take pole kind of accidentally, but do you happen to have a, a favorite pole trick or, sorry, Chris, this is your question. It's so that's a hard thing for me to answer. I, um, I am that annoying person if I walk into a pole studio that I like go into like a tricks class and I can just do things, <laughs> right? Like, and I don't know what I'm doing. I, I do not know what I'm doing, but I can, I can make my body do that thing. I've skipped like all the preceding steps, all of them. And I know that's not good. <laughs> So that is why I would never call myself a pole artist (laughs) because I'm an athlete who is strong enough and has, you know, like moved through similar pathways in a way that I can make myself do the thing. Um, But what I would say is the things that intrigue me the most about pole are the things that are completely nothing like what I, you know, my other apparatuses, like, I really like like handsprings, Aisha's, things like that because the leverage is so different than aerial apparatuses that like, it's just a completely different thing. And that, you know, that's fun sometimes. Like I, I'm doing 
I'm taking powerlifting lessons with a coach and I love it because it is just a completely different world. <laughs> there is nothing like it that, you know, than what I'm doing right in the other aspects of my life. Um, and so it's like my blank slate can just learn the thing. So th- those are my favorite things in poll, the things that are like, oh, I actually have to learn how to do this. It's not just like, strangely in my body I don't know why <laughs> you're like you're like what else you got oh. <laughs> no, it's, what you no, got it's, here <laughs> it's off it's awful it is not like like I have so much respect <laughs> for pole <laughs> and like I sometimes I'm just like I don't know why I can do this I, it it should be harder you know what, and it would have like- been if I would have <laughs> learned pole first <laughs> <laughs> uh <laughs> that's true about a lot of circus artists that, that do come into the pole studio though where we're like oh wow like handstands are there like all this stuff is happening but you're right like sometimes like we need to back check with them just a little bit so they can get all of the other things but it's amazing <laughs> that's so cool how you're just like I I know how to do this somehow I don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean I could break it apart but like it's like <laughs> I mean, that, that's, you know, like handsprings, for example, I had never tried it before. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay. It goes like this. One, two, I, third try. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't know what to do with myself when I was upside <laughs> down. Cause I was like, I didn't know how to hold the position. <laughs> Your brain did like all like the physics. You were like, got it. They're <laughs> <laughs> going man but that is that that is dangerous it really yeah is. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> like don't try to say don't yeah, don't, 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 don't be me <laughs> <laughs> one pole class doesn't make you a pole dancer <laughs> no, no definitely not also i um right before the pandemic i moved to oregon and I moved in with my mom here, um, which was just a, a wonderful thing because I, you know, instead of being locked down by myself for a very long period of time, because that's where I was in DC, I would have been like six months in my apartment by myself with my cats. Um, I was here in beautiful Oregon with my mom, who does pole. <laughs> So there was a pole in the house. And so in the first part of the pandemic, I didn't have my rig up outside and the weather wasn't good yet um, here in Oregon to be training outside. So I I did a lot of pole because it was just right, right in front of me all the time. Yes, mom, I love it so much. <laughs> no, <laughs> and my my mom got into pole because of me, because she wanted to do aerial, but they didn't have aerial in her area, but they had pole. So she started oh. taking wow. classes. I love it. She's like, I'll settle for this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so cool. I love it. More moms need to do pole. Yes. Absolutely. All the moms. Every mom. <laughs> well, have um, you done any have, uh, oh, oh. we're probably about to ask the same thing <laughs> same question <laughs> have you done any pole performances or showcases or do you plan on it if not so i um have run a a few different performance companies in my, in my aerial journey <laughs> Um, and I have directed shows and I, I spent, um, uh, time at NECA, which is the, yeah, <laughs> New England Center for Circus Arts and, um, had a residency there with my company. And so like, I've spent a lot of time in the performance space and performed a lot, um, and had every intention of really, you know, very intently pursuing more circus performance. Um, 
more so as a director than a performer, but, um, but I love doing both. And then when I got here in Oregon, the pandemic happened and my business just kind of blew up and got, you know, so big. And I felt like I needed to spend a lot of time and attention there. Um, and so I've kind of left the performance aspect to the side for a while. It's, it's still like talking to me some days more than others. Um, but it's just a lot harder to pursue because I live somewhere where there aren't a lot of um, good spaces for circus. And I, I was saying about pole, even um, the closest pole studio is an hour away. So there is just nothing where I live um, except me in my backyard rig, <laughs> which some days is really inspiring and some days is not at all. Um, so, you know, looking forward to traveling more over this next year and perhaps in doing that, connecting with more people and getting more excited about performing again. But right now I'm still very much in the like, have to build my business. I definitely understand and respect that. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Right too, and, and after COVID too, it was hard to like do performing and stuff like that too. So, but everyone's now getting back into the swing of things. So, yeah, hopefully we'll see more. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> well, what are what are your plans for the future? Do you have any like big projects coming up, or you're just gonna keep going with the flow? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I mean, part of that next in the next year is more travel. I uh, have the parish meeting, which I already talked about. I have two retreats um, scheduled. One is in uh, May in Mexico. I have to think about that for a second. <laughs> uh, with sweet retreats, um, which I'm co-hosting with my friend Britt Crempton, who was Ariel Firebird on the Instagram. And then in November, I am in, in the process of working on uh, bringing a retreat to Cambodia. So that, yeah, very excited to, to kind of branch out with regard to retreats. Um, I think retreats have, have gotten really popular and people are much more willing to spend the money for trancations than they used to be. And I think the bar is kind of keeps going up, right? People are looking for not just to be at the beach in Mexico or Costa Rica or wherever. They're like, what's the next thing? Cause I've already done that. Where, where are we going next? That is new and exciting. And guess what? As a coach, I want to go to cool places too. I don't want to go to the same place every year. I want to like see the world. Um, so I'm excited to uh, offer retreats that are going to be in really interesting places and expose people to different cultures. Um, yeah. And then also I'm going to be at the... American Circus Educators Conference in October in Austin, Texas, presenting on straight arm inversions. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be more, <laughs> more travel happening in 2023. But yeah, as far as what's going, what's upcoming, more travel, more opportunities to actually interact with people in person. Yes. That is so exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so you do this full time and, and just get to, to teach and do what you love. And that's so amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, wow. the amazing part about it is I, I had a vision <laughs> for making this a career but I don't think anyone else saw it 
right? Especially my mom. My mom did not see it. No. Um, I mean, she had confidence in me, but it was like, maybe you should redo your bar and practice some law on the side. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I, I, I see it. But I didn't really see it until COVID happened because the, the context changed, right? It, it was difficult for people to envision how they were going to, to get circus coaching online. Easier for polls specifically because people already had tons of polls in their houses. But prior to COVID, people didn't have rigs in their backyards for the most part. Um, and then suddenly everyone bought them and now they do. And even if they don't, they're, you know, realizing, oh, if I go to open gym at my studio, I can work on those things there. Um, and the, the culture around aerial coaching has changed in a way that it's become socially acceptable or considered safe enough, right? That people, you know, aren't ostracized for getting coaching outside of their studio environment. And that was absolutely the case a few years ago. Like it, it was, you, you do not work on this stuff on your own right? You have to go into the studio to do this. It's just not safe. Um, and then every aerial coach started offering stuff online when they realized that they weren't going to have a job anymore if they didn't change. And we recognize that, yeah, there, you know, there's always going to be safety issues, but is it really so much worse than it was before? Did a ton of people get injured in ways that they didn't get injured before? right? Generally speaking, things went pretty good. So now I think people are understanding that this can be done safely. Yes, a lot more information, you know, needs to be pushed out there to help people do it safely, but it can be done. And that opened up a whole market that didn't exist before. And I coincidentally had been you know, going into the online space and had clients online already. And so was set up to, you know, expand really quickly um, when the opportunity presented itself. And, and so, yeah, now I, you know, it's amazing that in a few years, my business has grown so much. Um, part of that is because I'd already started before the pandemic. Um, but now like it's, it's still just amazing to me that not only can I live on this, cause that's what I was thinking about before. I was like, how can I live? <laughs> not how can I be successful? How can I live? <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, like I had already written off all these things in my life. Like, oh, I'm never going to get to, you know, travel to Africa anymore, things that I got to do when I worked for the CIA, you know, things that, that I got to do when I had a six figure salary. I was like, I'm never going to, that's never going to happen for me because I've chosen to be a poor circus artist. <laughs> and now I'm like, wait a minute. No, actually I can be more successful now than I was working for the government. <laughs> <laughs> that there is much more possibility now in this life. Um, and so as I'm, you know, doing more mentoring of other coaches, part of that is moving into business coaching, still very much centered in like, you know, really good biomechanics and all of, all of the actual coaching aspects. But if you can't get clients you're not coaching. You have to have a relationship with someone. You have to have someone to coach. So the business aspects of coaching is vital for people to succeed in this industry and seeing that it, it can work and that it can be like, not just 
you know, living, but thriving, um, is part of now, like kind of the next phase of what I'm moving into, which is trying to help people like be really good at this and make money doing it. I, I really love that you say that and that you offer things for, you know, teachers and studio owners. Cause like, you know, for, for me, I did not go to business school and I was a dancer and now I have a studio and, you know, I, I learned by helpful friends. So having yeah. the resources, you know, it, it makes it so that anybody can, you know, live their dream and, and make money doing it and not have to worry about having any sort of other thing to do on the side. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I love that. I definitely want to check out your, I believe the, it was it the conclave that's the biggest one, the one for the coaches. For the Cardinal. coaches, yeah. The, the Cardinal, Cardinal one, yeah. yeah. Cardinal. I, I was like, thinking about that too. <laughs> like, I love what I do. I love dancing. I love everything I've, I've been given, but it's sustainability. And I want to start aiming more online like you do and making that money that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, it, that's the thing. Oh, I, I think it's important for people who are succeeding to actually like say that because I, there, I mean, I think there was a misconception with, within this industry that you, you can't make money doing this, right? All you hear are the people who aren't <laughs> mm. because for whatever reason, you know, there's this, I don't know if it's like the starving artist or the poor artist mentality, or I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is, but people are reluctant to um, show their success in the business aspects of this. They're very good about showing the <laughs> success of competing or <laughs> what those yeah, sorts yeah. of aspects, but not the business aspects. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's like, um, like, I know you were, you were speaking a little bit before about like, um, you know, the online teachers being like ostracized for like the safety and everything. And I wonder if it has to do with a little bit of gatekeeping. Like I have this wonderful thing and I don't want you to, to take it from me. Um, yes. But yes. in reality, like sharing is what's going to help us all grow and be more beneficial for everyone in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that scarcity mindset does no one any favors. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. But yeah. Definitely a lot to think about for sure. Let's share those Yeah. And that's why I was really happy that you were willing to come in and, and share your story too, because you are so successful and 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 if you're willing to share, we would love to like hear all the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say that um one of the biggest things is is being really consistent in showing up in your values, right? Like I think that people um, have, a, have a tendency to put things, especially on social media, that they think other people want to see. So they're manufacturing like this persona, right? And authenticity like really is key because what you know who you are is distinct and it's what makes you stand out from everyone else people aren't buying a product they're they're buying you right they want what you're selling even if the exact same thing is being sold by someone else and if you're in a space where there are hundreds and hundreds of pole coaches teaching the exact same tricks. Why do they buy something from you or why do they take classes from you? And so you have to show that, you know, to potential clients. If you keep all of that to yourself, then well, of course, people aren't going to take your classes or, or buy your, you know, packages or what, whatever it is. Um, so showing up consistently because once is never, <laughs> that's my, my friend Shante Cofield, um, says that. <laughs> and, you know, 
we think because we said something that everyone saw it, but I mean, algorithms, no, no. You have to say it over and over and over and maybe someone will see it once. You're not bothering anyone. Keep getting your message out. <laughs> Keep showing up. And it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be overthought. It's like, just like I was saying about not planning my content. I, I don't. I think of something. I make the post. I send it. Takes, you know, sometimes 10 minutes. That's it. I don't think about it too hard <laughs> because once is never, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, some people are going to see it, but they'll probably forget about it unless I say it 20 more times. Um, so show up, be consistent, show up in your values, show up as you are. So important. Love, love this advice. Thank you I for agree. that. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> And then do you have any advice for beginner aerialists or polars yeah. or anyone starting their aerial journey? Um, take class from a lot of different people. I think that people get very siloed and into um, particular coaches too soon and they think that that is the only way, right? And, and they can, you know, it, coaches only know what they've been taught. So we are representations of our coaches. And the more different styles and different ways of saying things you get in the beginning is, you know, is going to allow you not only to progress more rapidly, um, but enjoy the experience more. I mean, everyone, every coach is not right for every person. And that matching of personalities and styles um, is what's going to give you the best experience. And so, you know, if you live in a small town that only has one studio, venture out into the online space, travel, go to pole conventions, right? Do, do the things where you meet lots of different people in that space and get exposed to a lot of different styles because there is a lot out there and you might just not realize it yet. I love that you mentioned that oftentimes students will start in some aerial class and be, because they, they have a good experience, maybe they, they like the way the teacher taught or the teacher's attitude, they don't return. So I love that you just say, keep going, try someone else, find what works for you, your style, what training style. It's so important. So important. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that was all of the questions that I had to ask. I think we have another one because you truly do so much aerial fitness. I'm <laughs> curious about this answer. What is your favorite way to like grip up? Oftentimes pole dancers say dry hands, but is it anything different for you? No, dry hands, definitely. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing I will say, and I, I listened to the conversation you had with Britta <laughs> Remish. Um, but the, I have really dry hands, right? Some people have sweaty hands. I have super, super dry hands. So the, when I moved from DC, which is very humid to Oregon, which is actually, even though it's cloudy a lot, it's actually very dry. Um, suddenly like everything changed. <laughs> And I think people get, get kind of set in this is, this is the way it needs to be, right? Like this gets into pole, pole studios or aerial studio cultures. I know in Silk's classes, this happens a lot. And this happened in ones that um, I trained in when I was first starting, where there was an anti-rosin culture, right? Rosin was cheating. That is, 
that is the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> there is no judgment of gymnasts for using chalk. Okay? You just use as much chalk as you want. So that, that's all the stuff is. It's grip aid, right? Your body is different. The climate of the place you're in can change over the course of the year, or you can move, or you can be traveling to train, and you need something different. And, you know, the cultures should be accepting that people have different needs and, you know, we need to allow people to use what, what works for them. Um, within reason, like, um, I understand you're not going to spray rosin your hands and then get on the pole and that stuff takes forever to get off. But <laughs> yeah, you're just like glued to the apparatus. Yeah. <laughs> I am not falling. <laughs> <laughs> or like a foot mount, you just put it on your foot and be like, I feel really good. <laughs> foot rosin. I, I was training once I w was at, I don't know, like a, a workshop in Chicago and it was a rope workshop and we were learning different things. We had, most of us had brought our own apparatuses. So we were working on what we were used to be working on. And the coach, you know, showed us a thing and it was hard and everyone was trying it and like falling off of the rope. And there was one person who just nailed it on the first try. And we were like, what? How is that possible? <laughs> well, I went over to her rope and I went like this and my hand stuck to it. <laughs> she had so much spray rosin on the rope. It was like, like fly paper. Um, so. Not messing around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would not want to clean that rope after. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, they like shellac. And they get slippery at a certain point. There's like, it, you know, like tree, tree resin uh, sap where it dries and then it gets slippery. So at a certain point, you just have to throw the rope away. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. that, and we're talking like the same, day. like, <laughs> we're talking like high school gym rope, that kind of rope, right? Because I've never seen ropes, uh, like, aerial rope <laughs> <laughs> no it has like um well there are different types of ropes but what what i'm talking about is a cordelise which has okay. like a uh, like spanish web it has a cover a canvas cover and the core is either like lots of strings or a rope so wow. the rope aspect is inside of a canvas cover and the cover can get covered with rosin and get really slippery that's so fascinating you would, I would love have it. Thought it was a high school rope <laughs> that you do it for That would hurt. <laughs> right? That would really hurt. Like any knee pit holds. I was just thinking of that. I was like, I couldn't climb it, but I could definitely invert it. Try some knee <laughs> Back in the day, I was failing that gym class. <laughs> Although people do dance on the chains. Like, I don't know how they would do that. But that. Oh, I won't try. So hard. Not my thing. Not my thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's so beautiful though. Like everyone's so amazing. <laughs> um, uh, oh, I guess there's there is one more question. What do you do in your free time? Do you have any hobbies or like fun things other than <laughs> than aerial <laughs> or helping others? Yeah, I um I feel like my in my free time, I'm really boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's true of most people who do kind of, you know, have weird jobs than what their hobbies are, are like the most mundane things ever. Um, but I spend a lot of time standing in my backyard with a hose watering. <laughs> I could call that gardening, but it would be a lie because really all I'm doing is watering, but it's very peaceful. I listen to a podcast. Um, yeah, I, I do that. I walk, I walk a lot. I mean, like leisure walk, not like I'm trying to get cardio walk. Um, and I drink wine. I do like my wine. I, yeah. I live, I live in Willamette <laughs> Valley, 
which is like Pinot Noir capital <laughs> of the world. Um, so part of living here is like experiencing that. So all of the events in the area are always at wineries. Um, it's part of the, the beauty of living here. That's why glass a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I love how you say it, like watering is because I, I can see how that would be meditative because I often stare at, you know, like water, like waterfalls and stuff like that. So I understand. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes you need something that's completely nothing because of all of like the busy lifestyle that you, you live. <laughs> Yeah. And, and to get outside. I mean, then, mm. you know, I, because of the work I do, I do spend a lot of time at a computer. I know I, a while back I was talking about sitting at a desk and it <laughs> messing up. <laughs> Things just come full circle. I know, I know, <laughs> but I spend a lot of time in front of the computer and, and in Oregon, sometimes of the year, there's just not a lot of sun. Um, so when it is nice out, you feel compelled to just like sometimes stand there for periods of time. Enjoy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Actually, I was watching Portlandia and they had one, one skit about that where there was like the sun was in like one location and they all went to it and then it moved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. That is so true. That's so I mean, funny. That's true. The one thing I will say is that I live in the valley and it's a little sunnier here than Portland. Um, we get more days of sun and each day there's more sun within each day. So as you, especially like compared to Seattle, Seattle can get gray and it just stays gray here. We have like, even in the rainy times of the year, you still see the sky usually each day, just not for a very long period of time. So, so yeah, but so in the summer, it's completely gorgeous. There is no rain. There are no clouds. You spend a good three months of just blue skies. But because you've gone through that period of the cloudy, you just want to be outside that entire three months. For sure. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for sharing all about your pole journey and also about yeah. yourself and about your business and giving us business tips and how we can all um, make a living doing what we love. <laughs> so appreciate it. I love her. <laughs> yeah. I Is there anything else that you want to share? Any links that we will definitely add? Anything yeah. else for anyone who's listening? Um, yeah, everything that I talked about is on my website, which is circusmobility.com. And I am sure you will link it <laughs> to the <this> podcast. <laughs> um, and I have um, a quite a few free things that I offer. Um, awesome. One of which is a ten day uh, e course on the straight arm inversion, and it is super geeky and detailed. If you're having any trouble at all with your straight arm inversion, um, you will appreciate it. So. We'll link that as well. <laughs> right. I often think when I'm like hanging on the just like the pull-up bar, one day <laughs> maybe I'll just straight arm inversion. <laughs> well, maybe, you know. With the 10 day <laughs> course. Yeah. <laughs> Take I'll course, keep you let me know. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about the straight arm inversion. It's um it's strength, it's mobility, yeah. and then it's timing. So yeah. if you already have the strength and the mobility, then it's just timing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something I think that for that one, you have to keep your shoulders really engaged, right? Oh, yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, it's scap wrap. So we have upward elevation, posterior tilt, um, protraction. Basically, you're taking your scapula and you're wrapping it around the outsides of your armpits and lift it up. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Like that. So if you can keep um, that, yeah, <laughs> if you can keep that in your scapula, then you have a really strong base to engage the abs from to lift the legs up. Wow. And at a certain point, if you lift the legs high enough, um, you know, then it's just lats pushing down. And mm. the higher you've lifted the legs, the lighter your legs are in the push. So and you said just 10 days, right? 
<laughs> well, the course is 10 <laughs> lessons, um, but sometimes the individual lessons can take you a longer time. Yeah, for sure. Put for into sure. the body. Sure. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for providing all the free stuff too. And, and hopefully it'll lure, lure everyone into for the paid things because yeah. it's so much more uh, beneficial to get it for your own body. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I guess I don't. Do you have any more questions to to ask? Or should we uh, sign off? <laughs> I can't even remember if there was so many questions. <laughs> we could definitely sign off if you want. I, if there's nothing else, <laughs> I can't wait to see you start performing. I'm excited, whether it's whole or like anything. That right. <laughs> I, I do have stuff on the internet somewhere. I'm sure you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You. you get that random <laughs> like from months ago, years ago. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> All right, Jessica. Well, this is so much fun. Thank you so much for taking the time yeah. and, and sharing everything with us today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. Alrighty, are you a signing off or am I a sign off? Um, yeah, let's have you sign off. Alrighty, <laughs> thank you everyone so much for tuning in. This was such a fun episode. Thank you, Jessica from Circus Mobility for coming in. We are Paul on the call. I am Chris Rivers. <laughs> and I'm Mandy Mack. <laughs> and we are We're here with Jessica off. John and we are signing <laughs> off. <laughs> Ooh, Ooh hot pink. Ooh, I love those hot pink heels. Those are awesome. <laughs> yeah. So cute. <laughs> cool.